Welcome. What a delight to see you all here at the Harn Museum of Art. I am Eric Siegel, Director of Education, and it's uh, a genuine pleasure for me to both welcome you and to introduce Paul Ortiz. Uh, he is such a busy member of our community and of our university that I feel very lucky that we were able to present him as, one of, uh, as part of the programming for Shadow to Substance, an exhibition currently on view through February 27th in the uh, photography gallery featuring uh, photographs of African-American history and of contemporary black photographers focusing on contemporary concerns and issues. Curated by Portia Moore, Dr. Portia Moore, um, Professor of Museum Studies here at UF, uh, Kimberly Williams, a doctoral student in English, and Carol McCusker here in the audience today, our curator of photography here at the Harn. <sighs> Great. So. Um, Professor Ortiz has been here at UF since 2008 in, as a professor of history and as director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. If you're not familiar with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, please go to oral.history.ufl.edu and check out the website. If you think you know what oral history is, you'll be surprised at the amazing uh, engagement, dynamism, creative projects, uh, student uh, learning and training that goes on through the center, a really important, and community engagement as well, a really important part of the university uh, and very dynamic under uh, Professor Paul, uh, Ortiz's leadership. Um, Professor Ortiz um, is the author of a number of volumes. Here are three that, in fact, we're gonna be able to um, uh, let you see uh, in your own hands at the book signing after the talk. So those volumes include an African-American Latinx history of the United States. That's the first one here. Maybe I'll do it this way. Um, I believe this is the newest, your newest book. Uh, very exciting. Uh, People Power, History Organizing and Larry Goodwin's Democratic Vision in the 21st Century. And I think it's still warm from the press is my impression. And of course, Emancipation Betrayed, the hid hidden history of black organizing and white violence in Florida from Reconstruction to the Bloody Election of 1920, um, the subject in part of today's lecture. Uh, Professor Ortiz is also the co-editor of numerous volumes, including Remembering Jim Crow, African Americans Tell About Life in the Segregated South. And many of us are very enthusiastic about a book that's uh, very local to UF and to the community, um, African American Studies, 50 Years at the University of Florida, History of that Program. He is also the author of a number of forthcoming volumes uh, and co-edited volumes, very active as a teacher as well of undergraduate and graduate courses uh, in African-American history, Latinx, Latino, Latina history, comparative ethnic studies and other areas, of course, um, labor and social movement theory as well. He's also a scholar of service. Um, Professor Ortiz is a third generation US military veteran who served with the 82nd Airborne Division and the 7th Special Forces Group in Latin America. He's the faculty advisor for many UF student groups, including Dream Defenders, Poor Colombia, uh, Chispas, and others. And he is currently the president of the University Faculty of Florida, all of which keeps him very busy, all of which earns him an incredibly warm welcome from all of us for his lecture today. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for that very kind and charitable introduction. It's such an honor to be here. And you don't mind me take up my mask. We'll probably hear a little bit of, oh, I think it's kind of stuck. Is that okay? All right. You lost, um, it's like you have that mask, but it's still stuck on your. Okay. Take that off, and then if you can get that back on your, your left ear. Uh, it's here. Sorry, it's very personal. See, this is different than when the book came out in 2005. The technology has moved forward so much, it's, just, it's, just, it's incredible. So, well, thank you so much again, Eric, for that kind introduction. I'm just so thrilled and honored to be here at the Harn Museum um, to talk, be one of many speakers, this incredible exhibit that many of you have the opportunity to, to see. Um, I'm not going to start calling out these incredible people here, There's, but I'm very humble 
we have many community historians here. We have many museum professionals. We have um, just some incredibly historically and civically minded individuals. Um, so what I thought I would do today is really, and the only thing, Eric, is I'm going to need your help in getting the... I forgot to do that. I do have some slides. I'm a history professor, so you know I've got to have some slides for you, right? I think that looks good. Thank you. And what I want to do, it's kind of unusual for an author to be able to talk about a book, you know, 15, 17 years down the road. And so the talk I'm going to give today is very different than the kind of talk I would have given back in 2005 or 2006 when, when this book was first um, published by the University of California Press. And as Eric mentioned, I'll be talking mainly about emancipation betrayed. This is really a story of the black freedom struggle in Florida from reconstruction to the eve of the Great Depression. It's not the book that I set out to write originally. And I'll explain to you why it's so radically changed kind of in midstream. The key to, to why it changed and how it became the book that it did become and how it really set my whole uh, kind of intellectual trajectory and how I ended up here at the wonderful University of Florida, two words, oral history. And it was the oral histories with African-American elders which really put me on the path to becoming the historian that I am today, to directing UF oral history and all I really try to do with the Proctor program is to get my students and put them in contact with remarkable people who have stories to tell. Whether they're civil rights movement veterans, World War II veterans, rocket scientists, Holocaust survivors, you know, the, the, the first um, woman mayor in their small town in Florida or the Mississippi Delta, you know, whether they marched with Dr. King in St. Augustine in 1964, uh, whether they worked with Mrs. Vivian Filer in the movement in Alachua County, you know, those are the types of people that I'm trying to put my students in contact with. And the reason that I do that is because of the experiences I had as a graduate student writing the dissertation that eventually became this book. So I want to kind of start in reverse or kind of more recent um, the, the more recent past and kind of go back and you know, kind of wonder, well, what, what does Pensacola have to do with the story? Um, since this book has been published, I've received so many calls from individuals and groups who have told me, hey, my ancestor is in your book and I want to tell you about them. And, I, or, and I'm really glad that you highlighted them um, here's some more information about them I thought you'd like to know. So one day I got a call from a woman, and she identified herself as a descendant of the Reverend George Witherspoon of Pensacola. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's incredible. The Reverend George Witherspoon, who's in the book, was one of the last black elected officials in West Florida. He ran for Congress. He should have won. He really did win. That election was stolen from him by white supremacists, by Tallahassee, by the state of Florida. It was a very corrupt election. It was stolen from him. And we know this because we have a contested election book, which took, at, which took sworn testimony from numerous individuals. And even some of the white Democrats involved in stealing the election were very open. They said, well, yeah, we don't want Negroes to hold elected office in Florida. Of course we stole the election. They were very, you know, you have to give them white supremacists back their credit. They were very open. They were very blunt. It wasn't any of this, oh, I'm not a racist. They were proud of, of, of what they were doing back then. But Teniati Broughton called me and she said, you know, I'm a descendant of, of Reverend George Witherspoon. I said, wow, that's incredible. And before we knew it, she was running for city council which her ancestor, George Witherspoon, had been an elected black city council member during Reconstruction, and she won the election. And she is this incredible, very progressive city council person in Pensacola today, and has welcomed our students here at UF 
on three occasions, we we drove, loaded into vans, went to Pensacola, and done oral history interviews with African American elders in Pensacola, um, including people who took courses with um, the mother of Air Force General Chappie James. That name may be familiar with you, uh, to you. He was a, a heroic African American pilot was part of the Tuskegee Airmen connected to that historic movement in World War II and then Korea. And his mother taught a one room, or ran a one room schoolhouse for black students in Pensacola. And she was a legendary instructor. And so our students here have been able to interview students who took her courses uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. And that's the kind of work that Emancipation of the Trade has allowed me to employ our University of Florida students um, in, in doing. Another example is an event some of you participated in last summer um, here at the University of Florida. One day, about two or three years after the book came out, I got a call. And um, the gentleman who called me introduced himself as a descendant of a man who had been assassinated in Gainesville in 1904, and that man was Alonzo Felder's great-great-grandfather, the Reverend A.S.J. Allen. This past summer, we were finally able to honor the Reverend Allen in a, a formal ceremony at UF and also at the soil collection ceremony at the city of Alachua, and to put his name where it always should have been. He was a revered religious and political leader in Alachua County. He was one of the leading Methodist ministers in the South. President Theodore Roosevelt had put his name in, under consideration of being the, uh, perhaps being the postmaster of the city of, 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 of Gainesville in 1904. Can you imagine what that would have been? Uh, what, what, what great thing that would have been to have a black postmaster in the city of Gainesville in 1904? It wasn't to be. He was assassinated, and he was assassinated because of his stature and his standing and the fact that he was so beloved in the black community. But um, again, his grandson, great-grandson, Alonzo Feller, contacted me, and what I've been able to do, again, is to put our students in contact with him, with family members, trying to honor his family's history, trying to kind of restore the, the record of African-American political leadership and striving, it didn't just start in the 1960s. That's one of the main themes of this book, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But people like the Reverend A.S.J. Allen were part of this remarkable black leadership that thrived in this part of the country in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, and was only punctuated or stopped by white terror. That's the only thing that stopped, stopped this, this incredible group of leaders. Emancipation Betrayed really begins with the Dixie family in Gadsden County and Leon County, Florida. Uh, Laura Dixie, who's pictured here, was a leader, a rank and file leader of the Tallahassee bus boycott. And one of the great experiences of my entire life was being able to do an oral history interview, a series of oral history interviews with Mrs. Dixie and her husband, Sam, and Sam's older brother, A.I. Dixie. And that began in the summer of 1994. That was the first summer I arrived in Florida. And I don't have to tell you what it was like to be in the state of Florida in the spring and summer of 1994. Think back. It's right in the wake of the testimony, the very dramatic testimony given by the survivors and the descendants of the Rosewood Massacre. And it was an electric atmosphere in the state to be doing oral history. Because you open any major newspaper, the Miami Herald, the Orlando Sentinel, the Times Union, et cetera, et cetera, and chances are you were going to come across a letter to the editor about the Rosewood Massacre. And there was a lot of shock. There was a lot of uh, a lot of anger, um, a lot of embarrassment. Um, there were some people when when the survivors gave their testimony in Tallahassee, who said, you know, 
why are they bringing this stuff up? You know, Americans are forward-thinking people. Uh, we don't uh, we don't dwell in the past, right? And so, I was part of a three-team graduate student group from Duke University that came down to do oral histories that summer in Leon and Gaston counties, not about the Rosewood massacre, but about African American life before the civil rights movement. And this was a project that was sponsored by the National Endowment for Humanities. It was called Behind the Veil, Documenting African-American Life in the Jim Crow South. That eventually, part of that became the book that Eric alluded to, Remembering Jim Crow, which is an oral history collection about life in the South, again, before the Civil Rights Movement. But when I started interviewing Mrs. Dixie, in, in 1994, my idea about doing a, a, a dissertation and then my first book was to really do something about the Tallahassee bus boycott and about the origins of that incredible year-long community-based struggle. And Mrs. Dixie steered me in a much different direction. And what she told me was, well, you know, Paul, here's the thing. And you can see, I'm not going to read this, the narrative, but you can kind of read it at your leisure. You know, this is a woman who was the founder of a hospital workers union in the Florida Panhandle in, in the early 60s. You can imagine anything more difficult than that. This is a woman who was a rank and file organizer of a bus boycott where she would go from bus stop to bus stop to bus stop telling people, remember, we have a boycott, brother or sister. You can't ride the bus. And she could be very persuasive to get people to not ride the bus. But she was also the person, when I got to know her and her husband, Sam, in the 90s when she had just retired, who, if anyone in the, in the community had a problem, they would come to the Dixie family. If they were dealing with depression or drug addiction, there was always a spare bedroom for them to, to stay in. She was really, I think, the right-hand person behind Reverend C.K. Steele, who was, those of you who know about the Civil Rights Movement, know that Reverend Steele was the co-founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Council. But behind Reverend Steele, behind Dr. King, behind Reverend Shuttlesworth, were these incredible rank-and-file activists. And so when Mrs. Dixie passed away just a few years ago, one of the great honors of my life was to be able to give a remembrance for her at Bethel Baptist Church, which is one of the great movement churches in this country, in, in Tallahassee. Uh, she, she was called the mother of the movement in Tallahassee. This is the kind of stature she had. She never attended college, and she made that opportunity possible for her children, and people just loved her. And when I started interviewing her, and I said, wow, Mrs. Dixie, you did all this, you did that, you know, you, you, you helped win the boycott, you, you registered thousands of people to vote, you worked with, you mentored these young activists, people like Patricia Stevens Duke, if you're familiar with that name, really, some people call Mrs. Duke the Fannie Lou Hamer, Florida. But when I would talk to Mrs. Duke, she would say, Paul, Mrs. Dixie was the one who mentored me. She was the one who, when we needed bail to get out of jail because we didn't involved in direct action, we went to Mrs. Dixie. And, but Mrs. Dixie told me something very important. She said, Paul, we did a lot of things in the 1950s and the 60s. But if you're interested in black political movement building, struggle, I really wish you could have spoken to my grandmother, my great grandmother. Man, back in the day, Paul, in the 1890s of Reconstruction, that was when they had the real battles. And that was what we learned from her mother, Mrs. Dixie's mother. When Mrs. Dixie, as a young African-American woman, went out into service to work for white people to clean their houses, her mother told her and told her employers, my daughter will not be coming through your back door. If you want her to work in your household, she won't come in the front door. Now, that's kind of edgy in the 1930s and 40s and 50s uh, in the state of Florida. But Mrs. Dixie insisted to me, Paul, you got to go further back. 
if you're interested in our freedom struggle, you've got to go further back. And so that's how I ended up writing a book about the black freedom struggle between Reconstruction and the eve of the Great Depression. And this is how it kind of panned out. Mrs. Dixie's husband, Sam Dixie, drove me out to Gadsden County to do an oral history interview with his older brother. And his older brother, A.I. Dixie, started telling me about just a whole cast of characters I didn't know existed. Like, now when we talk about the civil rights movement in, in, in the 60s and 70s, we're just at the point where we're saying, hey, the really important people are the people that we didn't identify the first time around. Okay. And so W.S. Stevens was a person that Reverend Dixie told me about. Now, Reverend A.I. Dixie, if you can imagine him, if, if I can kind of draw him for you, grew up as a plantation worker. He became a sharecropper. In the 50s, he got the call and he became a minister. And he was the one who hosted many civil rights workers from the Congress of Racial Equality in Gadsden County and Leon County. And he would drive around with these young interracial teams of civil rights workers. You know, you kind of get the, the image of these, these, these really idealistic young white uh, and black college students who come into states like Florida and Mississippi, but they all had hosts. They had people who protected them. And Reverend Dixie would drive around these young white female students to register people in the community in Gatton, Quincy and Greensboro and River Junction and those small towns to vote. And he had his shotgun with him just in case to keep all the young civil rights workers safe. But he referred me to this movement that I didn't know anything about. And he kept on saying, well, you know, back in 1920, when I was a young boy, there were so many things happening, Paul. And you have to understand the lodges and the secret societies and the organizations before the NAACP. W.S. Stevens was one of these individuals that he referred to quite a bit. And there's an official story about Dr. Stevens. And then there's the story I was, I was able to recapture via oral history, talking to his daughters, talking to his descendants, talking to people who knew him. So the official story about W. Stevens is that he was this prominent black doctor, one of the few black doctors in the state of Florida, very successful business person. Um, you know, he had founded a hospital. It's kind of mysterious because everything referring to him says he founded a hospital, but I can never find any records of where this hospital was. So in doing oral history, some of the mystery was, was revealed. And I won't read this entire thing, but to me, this is a great lesson about why oral history is so important. So you have the official record, you have what the state says. And I tell my oral history students, if you believe everything that your government tells you, then oral history is probably not for you. If you believe everything your professor tells you, then oral history is not for you. Oral history is for you if you question authority, if you are curious, if you think, well, maybe I'm not getting the full story. So this was a case study for me because there's an official story about W.S. Stevens, but then in interviewing his family members and people who had known him, a fuller story comes out. And, and this is a remarkable story of struggle, of tragedy, of sacrifice, of endurance. This is a person who suffered to try to re help his community regain the right to vote in the 1910s and 1920s. His house, and I interviewed both of his daughters, the house was regularly shot into as late as the 1950s. And the family finally had to relocate to Tallahassee from Quincy to escape white political terrorism. The hospital that he built, in part with his own hands, the white medical establishment was infuriated. They wanted a black doctor to go that they could control to work with plantation workers. They didn't want an independent black hospital. And so they went and blew up that hospital and burned it to the ground. And that's why I never, you know, that's why we couldn't find records of, of, of the hospital because it had been blown up. 
And for emancipation of trade, he's part of this, what I call the Florida Freedom Movement of 1920. He's part of this network of political activists. And we know some of their names. Mary McCloy Bethune, James Weldon Johnson, Walter White, who were in this state, who were organizing people to register to vote, to regain the right to vote, to break down one party rule, to break white supremacy, to bring equal educational opportunities to their children. So I want to turn out to, you know, kind of explaining where this incredible social movement came from. I didn't know this at the time, but as I was talking to my dissertation advisors and older movement veterans about this movement, they said, well, you know, Paul, what you're finding is the movement before the movement. This is what our grandparents and great grandparents were doing. Oftentimes they pass these stories down to us uh, as we were growing up after World War II. But to understand why the Florida movement, why the black freedom struggle was so strong in Florida, in the early 20th century, we've got to go back to the Civil War. There was a large number of African-American soldiers, veterans of the United States Army, who settled in Florida. There were many African-American women who had worked in different capacities with the Union Army as nurses, as laborers, as spies. Um, there was a large number of black Floridians who served with the United States during the, the, during the Civil War. And it's important for us to understand, to kind of get back in the mindset of the 1860s and 1870s, to remember what the Civil War was about, and to remember that people understood, even though we unfortunately too often have forgotten today, that it was black people who saved this country from destruction. And Abraham Lincoln wanted everyone to be clear about this, especially beginning during the summer of 1864, when he was in the, really the most, probably the most important presidential election in this nation's history. We talk about how, you know, the next election is gonna be the most important one. Don't ever say that to a historian. <laughs> because I'm like this, the, the presidential election in summer 1864 is pretty darn important. Abraham Lincoln is very unpopular, a lot of white folks want the Civil War in the North to stop. He's running against the former commander of the Union Army, George McClellan, who's very popular. Mac is his nickname. And Mac has said that if he wins the election, he thinks it's time to end the war. Let the South go its own way. Let them keep their institutions. Everyone knows what that means. Slavery will survive. And so Lincoln is behind. There weren't polls back then. But if there were polls, he probably would have been running way behind. And so a lot of people came to President Lincoln and said, President Lincoln, you know, you could boost your popularity if you just say, hey, if I'm reelected, we're just going to end the war. Let the South keep slavery. But let's just kind of, it was a big misunderstanding. Lincoln doesn't do that. And this is why, and again, I'm not going to read this, but Lincoln is trying to remind people it's black people, y'all, that save that are saving this country. And if we stop with our new anti-slavery crusade, we're going to lose the war. Is that what you want? Do you want two different countries here? Because if you take black people out of the equation now, the war is lost. And this is where African Americans have this sense of citizenship. And it's, it's a sense I talk about we earned our citizenship. That's the mindset. The government didn't give us anything in 1865. It didn't set us free. We earned that freedom. And even when the Emancipation Proclamation was passed, it was passed as a labor measure. That's how President Lincoln referred to it. He said, without the labor of the Negro, the war is lost. And he says this increasingly. But who are the rank and file people? Well, one of them is a young corporal and color bearer by the name of Matthew M. Louie. He is so important for the history of the, of the black freedom struggle in Florida. Some of you have seen me give entire hour-long talks about just Matthew Louie. So I'm not going to do that today. But I'm just going to tell you that he is just one of 
hundreds and even thousands of young black men who comes to Florida with this enhanced sense of citizenship. We earned citizenship, it wasn't given to us. He was severely wounded at the Battle of Honey Hill. In fact, uh, at one point they thought he was gonna die. Luckily, he convalesces from his wounds and he becomes this long distance freedom movement activist from reconstruction to the election of 1920 when he's about 83 years old he's still registering people to vote and he's still leading voter registration workshops so if you ever think oh man i'm kind of i'm too old to do that think of matthew Lewis. i mean he's just the energy the passion he has is just really and I tell the story in the book, and, and I've, I've been able to find a lot of things since this book came out. And if I had a chance to write this book again, I would do much more of a deep dive into some of the individuals that were very important during Reconstruction. Matthew Louie is one of them. So some of this information about Matthew Louie is not in Emancipation the Trade. Black politics in Reconstruction are radical politics. This idea, labor is the basis of all wealth. When I read this to my students, I say, who, who made that? Who made this quote? You know what a lot of them say? Yes. Yeah, Karl Marx, so like, who, who, who says that? <laughs> Billionaires aren't the basis of all wealth? No, in this time, African Americans coming out of their experience in Florida, coming out of their experience in Georgia and South Carolina, understand how wealth is created from start to finish. Not in the boardroom, not in the lab, in the cotton field, in the tobacco field, in, in the cotton factory's house. And so this idea of labor is the basis of all wealth puts them immediately in a political orientation, which white business supremacy immediately sees as a threat. The white business supremacists, the people that are trying to run this society, the foreign plantation owners, current plantation owners, corporation, railroad people are like, we can't have this. Labor is the basis of our wealth. We can't have an enfranchised black working class because if they have the right to vote with this kind of ideology, you're talking about democracy. And the term democracy in the 19th century is associated in the minds of people like Andrew Carnegie with mob rule. And this is why Andrew Carnegie comes out in support of white supremacy in Florida. There's this incredible moment of promise. And this is part of what I would talk about if I wrote the book today. So Josiah T. Walls is in the book. Matthew Louis is in the book. But what I failed to do when I wrote my dissertation and when I published Emancipation to Trade in 2005 was I failed to, to follow Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois's guidance. Never make that mistake. Uh, historians, when W.E.B. Du Bois tells you to do something, just do it, okay? So Du Bois taught us in the Great Depression that Reconstruction was an international phenomenon. It was an international struggle on behalf of the proletariat of the entire world that if black people would have won in Reconstruction, it would have created a level of freedom for working class people, not just here, but in India, in South Africa, in Latin America. And what I failed to do when I was writing Emancipation of Trade was I, 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 I conceived of, of Reconstruction primarily as a local and national phenomenon. And so I talk about Josiah T. Walls in the context of his work in, in Congress a bit, and primarily as a black political leader in Florida. What I failed to note was that's not how he saw himself. Josiah T. Walls saw himself as an internationalist, as a black internationalist, because that's how African-Americans thought about politics in the 18th and 19th century. That's how Richard Allen thought about politics. That's how Paul Robeson thought about politics. That's how Du Bois thought, thought about politics. That's how Amy Garvey thought about politics in the 1920s, internationally speaking. 
And so it makes perfect sense that, and again, I didn't have this emancipation decree, but I was able to put this in an African American and Latinx history in the United States about a decade later, that when African Americans were emancipated, in 1865, the first thing that the political leadership did all across the South was to say that emancipation in one country is not enough. What about slavery in Cuba? What about slavery in Brazil? What about slavery, even what about serfdom in Russia? Okay, that was the, that was the radical mindset of black abolitionists. That was Frederick Douglass in 1865. We're not shutting down our anti-slavery organizations. If we if we shut them down, and like some of our white brothers and sisters are asking us to do, and by the way, we love Mr. Garrison. We'll never forget how hard he fought his entire life on our, our behalf. But if we shut them down, what will it say to us as uh, say about us as a people that we turn our back on our, our brethren in Latin America and Asia? We can't do that. And so African Americans in Florida organize a national movement to build solidarity to support the Cuban freedom struggle in the 1860s and 1870s. It's a remarkable movement that I get into in FMINX. Josiah T. Walls was a great speaker. And if only we had a recording of his voice, he goes to the House of Representatives and makes these incredibly eloquent talks about freedom internationally, starting here in Gainesville. He uses his experiences here in Gainesville as a platform to talk about national equality and international solidarity. So exciting. Matthew Louis, meanwhile, is on the end of Ford. He's the captain of the county militia, uh, which is an officially recognized body of African American men, primarily have been Union soldiers. And you can imagine how crazy this makes white supremacists feel. These are men who officially defend physically black churches from being burned down by, terror, by white terrorists. They defend black schools in our region from being destroyed. And you can imagine how angry that makes a lot of the Ku Klux Klan leadership. They don't like Matthew Lewis. They don't like Josiah T. Walls. They're scheming constantly. How can we undermine black political leadership and sweep them out and stop the Negro from voting. Gainesville is at the center of so much political excitement and energy. This county hosted in 1984 a remarkable political meeting called the Colored Men, State Conference of the Colored Men of Florida. Incidentally, the same year that Porter's Quarters was found as a community. But I found the record of this political meeting held here in the Frederick Douglass papers in Washington, D.C., because Frederick Douglass was so excited about this meeting. These were, these were political, black political leaders from all over the state who came to Gainesville in 1984 to address the crisis of voter suppression, to address the crisis of segregation, to address the crisis of unequal schooling, in this entire state. But they saw Gainesville as a base because of people like Matthew Louie, because of L.D. Chestnut, because of Josiah T. Walls. And so no surprise that they came here. I don't have time to talk about their, their proposals. I talked about this emancipation of the trade. One of them is an early slavery reparations We ask that the state compensate us for just the last 30 years of slavery, the money you would have paid us and our parents. And we propose you take that money and create a sinking fund that will, for the first time ever, create an equitable public education system in the state of Florida. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You can imagine how... I mean, at the time, Florida was having governors like this one guy, a lot of them were former Confederate generals. George Millionaire Drew was one of them. How do you think George Millionaire Drew would have responded to this notion of creating a truly equal public education system? 
Yeah. Just shake your head because that's how he responded. Okay. But the real genius, too, of this plan was that this conference, Colored Men of Florida, creates the blueprint for the Independent Party of Florida. This is a political party which, for the first time, openly calls for black and white interracial Asian alliance to, and because and a lot of white folks by this time are very dissatisfied with the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party at that time was set up to, to take votes away from black people. The premise was, if we can stop black people from voting and take all their political power away, then all white people will be equal, even Stephen, and they'll thrive and have big farms and be wealthy. Did it work? No. It was just divide and conquer. It was a scam. It was corruption. And so this plan, which is birthed in, in Gainesville, is to create an interracial political party called the Independent Party of Florida. And the only thing that defeats it, fraud and violence and the failure, the willful failure of the federal government and the state government to ensure fair and free elections. I talked in emancipation and trade, I'm kind of, kind of wind up here to, to take a Q and A, but I want to talk just a little bit about, again, why white leaders demand disenfranchisement. It's an economic, it's a political issue. White leaders like the descendants of Richard Paul, like George Millionaire or Drew, like Napoleon Bonaparte Broward, the list goes on and on and on, say we can't have the economic development we want as long as black people are voting and have political power. We don't want equal schools. We don't want democracy. We don't want black communities having access to uh, running water, to, to sewers, to things like that that come a bit later. We don't have the resources for that. And so we're just going to cut off black people from citizenship. And it gets so bad that in uh, 1907, Governor Napoleon Bonaparte Broward, in his State of the State address, calls for the expulsion of all black people from the state of Florida. Now, it's not really a serious proposal, because if all black people were expelled from the state of Florida in 1907, this state's economy would collapse, like, overnight. But it's the kind of rhetorical move that those of us who grew up in segregation can recognize very quickly, right? It's a misdirection. It's a kind of a George Wallace boast. Well, I, I propose we get rid of all people in Florida, all black people in Florida, just to assuage white sentiments. The state legislature is like, well, no, we can't do that, but here's what we can do. We can abrogate the 14th and 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And so that passes the Florida State Senate in 1907. And then the lower house says, well, wait a minute, guys. If you redo this, like, oh, by the way, Oregon has done this. Other states have done this. I don't know if you know this, but other states have actually abrogated the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. But the lower house of Florida in 1907 says, let's not do that because that would invite federal interference. By the way, we don't enforce those amendments anyway. Okay. So I'm going to, this gets me to the movement in 1920, and really, which is the capstone of this book. After African Americans have been disenfranchised for two generations, this incredible social movement, they form. In 35 different counties, African Americans formed local voter registration movements all the way from Pensacola to Jacksonville to Gainesville to Miami to Orlando, all the major counties, black organizations, churches, secret societies, labor unions, women's clubs. Mary McCloy Bethune, again, is a pivotal part of this movement. She's the state leader of the Colored Women's Club movement. She's the, the regional, the southeastern leader. And she has national stature as well. And she's the leader of a very, probably the most important black institution of its time in the state of Florida. And I'm, I had the great privilege of being able to interview, do oral histories with a number of her former students. And the way they talk about Mrs. Bethune is the way you talk about 
just a beloved mother, uh, uh, someone who's more than a teacher, someone who's more than a college president, but someone who was beloved, who cared about you, who insisted that when white, when wealthy white donors came onto the campus of, of her college of Daytona Normal, that they respected young black women. And that was her crusade, was for the entire society to understand that black womanhood must be respected. And in the lead up to the 1920 presidential election, she gets together a group of black leaders from Daytona and she, and she closes the curtains to her office and she looks each of them in the eye and she says, for heaven's sakes, Eat your bread without butter, but pay your poll tax. And that's her mantra over and over again. And she and a number of other black women who were leaders like people like Emma Collier in Orlando, people like Eartha White in Jacksonville, are doing voter registration workshops in the months leading up to the 1920 presidential election. And they're teaching men folk how to register to vote, how to pay their poll taxes. They're agitating as much as they can for the 19th Amendment. They know the, night the women's suffrage amendment is on the horizon, but they're incredibly active. And here's Eartha White in Jacksonville. And World War I is another one of these turning points in US history. Because when we get to really the, the last chapter of this book and the conclusion, it isn't, like when I was in college, what I was told is that, you know, uh, there's a great poem, you know, we return fighting. Uh, when young black men came back from the trenches in Europe, they demanded citizenship, equal e e equality in the South and in the North, right? And that's true up to a point, except for before they even left for France in World War I, it was people like Mrs. Bethune and Eartha White and Emma Collier who told the entire nation, yes, yet again, we will send our young men off to fight for this nation. By the way, we fought in every war from the American Revolution, but this time it's gonna be different. This time the outcome is going to be equal citizenship. No more Jim Crow, no more second class citizenship. It's gonna be full equality. And Mrs. Bethune was very clear about this. Even before there's the mass enlistment of young black, white, Hispanic, Puerto Rican, and other men to go fight in France, because one of the things you have to remember is that in World War I, Uncle Sam doesn't have enough money to outfit all of these soldiers. Where is the money going to come from? There is no system of taxation. There is no $800 billion Pentagon budget back in 1917. And so Uncle Sam puts his hand into your, into your uh, pocketbook. He says, I need you to give me some money to fight this war. Black communities get together, churches, women's clubs, labor unions again, and raise money and give it to Uncle Sam to outfit that great allied expeditionary force that's going to go fight the Germans in World War I. And black communities in this state, as hard pressed as they are economically, heroically are raising funds to fight the war, again, even before the young men step foot in France. So you better believe as the young men are coming back from France, that black communities in this state are primed and ready to go. They're registering people by the thousands all across the state. And it's really putting, I apologize, it is a Sunday, it puts the fear of God into white supremacy in Florida. It really does. The whole state is, the power structure is shaken to its core. You have these incredibly talented leaders, people like James Weldon Johnson, and again, to kind of, to kind of come a full circle, all these people are Floridians. They're African Americans who are nurtured and raised in black communities in Florida, and they have a very strong respect for black history. Think about James Weldon Johnson's work. Think, think about Mrs. Bethune's work. Very strong respect for black folklore, oral history, Religious sermons from slavery, God's trombones is one of James Olden Johnson's signature publications. A, a, a black pride, if you will, that makes this movement so, so very powerful. 
And of course, who shows up leading voter registration workshops in Pensacola and Jacksonville, but Matthew Ruth, a Civil War combat veteran. This is 1920. He's still active. To conclude, this is something I didn't get into, into the book, but the voting lists that I was able to reconstruct, because there was so much anti-black political violence in Florida, most of the voting rolls have been destroyed. A few have survived. We have affidavits and testimony taken by groups like the Gainesville NAACP and other groups. And one of the things that I discovered in this research was that the rank and file of the people trying to vote in 1920 were black working class people. That was the structure of the economy. And so you see, I have page after page. Uh, Jacksonville is one of the places I was able to kind of reconstruct. These are African-American women who, who spent hours on election day trying to vote and were denied the right to vote. The young black photographer who's taking photographs of these long lines the Jacksonville police came up to him, confiscated his camera, destroyed it, and told him they would kill him if he spoke about it. Okay? This was a situation all over the state. Miami, hundreds of African Americans lined up to register to vote. The Klan came actually in horseback and started beating people in the line. In River Junction, in Greensboro, Massive shootouts where the Klan came to, to stop black people to intercept them from going to the polls. Akoe. We know what happened in Akoe. The Akoe massacre. Emancipation betrayed is, it was used. Uh, I worked with Senator Bracey's um, uh, staff uh, a few years ago when they were putting together the Akoe bill to require every school district in the state to teach about what happened in the Akoi Massacre. And we have that as a law now. Um, a lot of people don't know that. If you know me well enough, you know I'm going to leave you with some kind of action plan. There's got to be some kind of action. So one of the action plans is that we have this law in the books now. It says that every school district in the state has to provide content in its public schools about the Akoi Massacre. Can we, make, can we not make sure that that happens? Please. This is the greatest, to me, the, the, the Black Freedom Movement is the greatest civic engagement story we can teach, teach students. There's no other story that even comes close to it. It's about generations of people who were denied the basic aspects of citizenship, who fought to gain them, only to lose them, and the, you know, starting with the American Revolution, one out of every, approximately one out of every five or six soldiers in George Washington's Continental Army is a man of African descent. So a few black people in the North gain the right to vote after the American Revolution, only to lose it in the 1820s and 1830s. And states like Pennsylvania, New York, who gerrymander their constitutions to exclude black men from voting, many men who had voted for 20, 30 years. Reconstruction, African Americans earned the right of citizenship by their Civil War service. Almost completely recreate democracy, create the first system of public schooling that this region has ever seen, and then lose that right with, with white terrorism and voter suppression. And then the Great Depression, in the 1960s. So it's a battle back and forth, back and forth. Best civic lesson that you can possibly teach. And I think that that is really how this book has been used probably most predominantly in teaching people about just things like, you know, it's really important to vote, y'all. It's really important. Don't take anything we have for granted. So I feel like I should kind of wrap it up now and leave time for Q&A. But thank you for being such a patient audience. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's so fantastic, uh, inspiring, terrifying. Uh, thank you for the action plan, the Koei Massacre. Inform ourselves. Get active. 
We have time for Q and A. Uh, Anna has a microphone for that side of the room. I have a microphone over here. If you have a question or a comment to share, we'd love to bring the microphone to you. Ms. Vivian. So your challenge is very good. Your challenge though, adds on an entity that should be attached to what's already being taught. And there is a curriculum for schools to adhere to, and it's not been adhered to. So dropping this in the middle is not gonna do it. That needs to be a part of the curriculum that's already there that's not being instituted. And it's certainly not in all the schools in Florida. And I don't know if the rest of you all know, but we know who our governor is. So I'll just leave it right. at that. Exactly. Thank you so much, Ms. Farrell. This one's kind of silly, but is the one guy's middle name actually Millionaire? It was his nickname. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, because he was so... The thing about what happened to Florida after, after white business supremacy defeated Reconstruction, and you have a white ruling class, and this is something that I learned when I was in grad school at Duke, and it's in a book called uh, The Origins of the New South by C. Van Woodward. And this state legislature, led by George Millionaire Drew, actually gave away more land to corporations and railroads than even existed. And it became kind of an open scandal. And Florida became the butt of national um, jokes. Now, has that ever happened to Florida before? Right, the Florida, this is like the old Florida man thing, but yeah, nationally they'd be like, wow, you know, Florida has given away so much land to the railroads, it doesn't even have the land it's giving away. You know? So yeah, Millionaire Drew, that's that's where, where he gets his, his nickname. He's just giving everything to wealthy folks. You know, but see, that's what made the African American freedom struggle so important because African Americans are small farmers. They're they're small business owners. They're trying to build capacity, and they see a promise here. There was even a phrase: "Florida could be the Negro's new Jerusalem." That was a phrase you heard a lot in the few years after the end of the Civil War. And I don't want to to offend anyone, but. Basically, the reason people like Walls and Louis said that is because at that point, there weren't that many corporations here. There weren't that many railroads here. Whenever a railroad was put through uh, your town, it was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you know you needed railroads to, to move your commodities. On the other hand, states and federal government were in the habit of giving massive land away. You know, sometimes 10, 15, 50 miles on either side of a rail line to that corporation. Did they really need all that land to build a railroad line? And see that land is being land taken away from small farmers. And that's why the Independent Party of Florida gets some traction because they're like, hey, you know, small black and white people should really come together because people like George Millionaire Drew, he talks about how, how all white people are superior, but he sure doesn't treat poor white farmers like that. I don't know how many of you read a, a wonderful novel called The Yearling. That's a story of poor white people. And the reason they're poor is not because they're not working hard. It's because they can't get access to good land. That good land is already controlled by railroads and corporations. Thanks to millionaire Drew and his counterparts. And they would always pick, by the way, this is going to sound very familiar, in the South, these railroads, these boards would always pick a former Confederate general to be the figurehead. Why would they do that? Why did we have a General Finley Elementary School in Gainesville for what, 80 years? We picked the figurehead. So anyway, um, hopefully that gets back to it. Hello, per Professor Ortiz. How are you doing today, sir? Good, thank you. How are you doing? Good, good, right. good. Uh, so I, I heard as part of your bio that you're uh, you're a veteran and you're an 82nd guy. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, 
I'm a 101st guy from back in the day, so right. and, uh, don't hold it against me. Nobody is perfect, right? Um, so I, I really appreciate the way that you sort of kind of work through things and break things down. And I was really interested in what you had come across in terms of Gainesville being a place where, you know, at some moment in time, people had kind of put their heads together and sort of tried to envision a way that we could kind of live in a more just multiracial, you know, a democracy, right? Uh, and I've, I found that really interesting that this was sort of a place that would, sounded like was a, a center of gravity for that. And I also sort of, when I look back at things and look back at events, you know, it's kind of part of that, that military mindset that maybe you and I kind of share where you sort of look at events and decisions and courses of action that could have been engaged in but weren't. Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of a, a little bit of a wind up to say, can you give us any more insight on kind of what was happening in that time period and were there any events where, you know, if a jump ball would have gone one way or the other, things could have been different, you know, any kind of like punctuated moments of like, you know, urgent kind of consequentiality. That's sort of my, yeah, I my love, I love the question and it speaks to the distinctiveness of a city like Gainesville and these historical contingencies, what could have been. So 1884 is one of those, what could have been moments because if the independent party of Florida could have kept together its cohesiveness and survived, then yes, we would have had a very different political future in this state. We'd be living in a very different society. If black people could have broken through in 1920 and regained the right to vote in, in Florida, we'd be living in a very different world today. I, I can't even begin to tell you. Uh, I mean, Imagine the civil rights movement happening a half century earlier. Okay, so just for starters. But here's another thing. I'm so glad you mentioned again, the military context is really important. My training as a historian really began in the US military. And it was going overseas, being in Central America and looking at the US from the outside in, especially from the perspectives of people from the region who were asking us, what are you all doing down here? And did you know you're only the latest? You know, y'all have been coming down here for over a century. What is it that you really want to do? You know, I didn't know that. I thought it was the first one, you know, for who was it, ends up in Honduras or Colombia or Venezuela. And in Emancipation Betrayed, there's a sequence about Key, about Key West. And I came across this phrase that a journalist had written when he had spent a week in Key West. And he referred to Key West in the 1880s as the freest town in America. And I was like, really, Key West? I'm gonna look into this. And what I discovered that in Key West in the 1880s, there were all these refugees from Cuba who had been freedom fighters against the Spanish Empire, who had lost the War of Cuban Liberation, right? And so they fled. They ended up in Ybor City, New York, Baltimore. But a lot of them ended up in Key West. A lot of black soldiers who had fought in the British Empire, who were in the Bahamas, left the Bahamas and ended up in Key West in the 1880s. And they kind of mixed with African-American Union Army veterans. And they formed this, what was known as a boisterous and bilingual political coalition in Key West. And for a while, they're electing black political officials and white progressives. And for a while, because of their military background, they're able to keep the Ku Klux Klan at bay. What's happening in the mainland is not affecting Key West for a while. But the only reason it isn't is because they guard all of the harbor points are being guarded to make sure that the Ku Klux Klan in the Florida Peninsula cannot infiltrate Key West. So there's a military operation that, that's going on. But the phrase is boisterous and bilingual. And all of the political meetings are held in English and in Spanish. 
And there's this thing called alien declarant voting. And I talk about this a little bit in the book. Again, if I rewrote this book again today, or today, I'd have a whole chapter on that. Some of you are familiar with what just happened in New York City. New York City just granted provisionally the right to vote in local elections to permanent resident aliens. Something like this happened in Reconstruction, y'all, and it was incredible. It was transformative. Alien declarant voting allowed people who we would refer to maybe as current resident aliens, although it's a different category, to vote. All you had to do, you could just have arrived from Cuba and you could have the right to vote. If you signed a statement saying, I, I, I promise after I vote to begin the naturalization process of becoming a citizen. And that meant that those Cuban men, because again, remember voting is just limited to men back then, that they became politically active the moment they arrived on Florida soil, thanks to black reconstruction, which had created this new institution called alien declarant voting. But alien declarant voting wasn't brand new, by the way. It had existed before the Civil War. But before the Civil War, it was a settler colonial institution. It was saying that we need all white people from Germany or Ireland. We don't care if they're citizens, but we need them to vote because we want to make Oregon Territory a state. Okay, that's the root of alien declared voting. But in Reconstruction, it's a new context. And it's Cubans joining with African Americans in these really interesting alliances that hold for a while. But then with the defeat, with the rise of white supremacy, Florida changes its constitution. I think 1895 abolishes alien declared voting. Andrew Carnegie, by the way, steps up to support that move. You can imagine why Andrew Carnegie doesn't want immigrants voting. Because they're working in steel mills. He doesn't want them to the power. So those are some of the things. But again, military veterans play such a key role in, the, in, this, in this story. Uh, let's have a last question from Ms. Vivian. Oh, I... I... It's probably kind of long. First of all, I want to say thank you, Dr. Ortiz. I always enjoy your lectures. I've heard many of them. Uh, I'm sitting here listening to this one, and I'm almost in tears because um, how I grew up and everything. You talk about Mrs. Bethune, right? Talking about Mrs. Bethune, uh, and uh, you interviewing some of her uh, former students. My mother and four of her sisters were all former students. So I grew up listening to stories my mother told me, I mean, as a little small child, of Mrs. Bethune. But I want to talk about, just ask you a question to draw parallels. And the reason why I'm so emotional is because I, I what I see is um, this continuation of making these gains and being in the pushback. So right now, can you draw any kind of uh, parallels to what's going on right now as far as, uh, um, especially since 2013, when they weakened the uh, preclearance and allowed all these southern, historically southern oppressive states to do whatever they want to do with with uh, with voting, yeah. can you draw? Because uh, it, it's it's serious, and I think a lot of people yeah. don't realize how serious it is, especially a lot of young folks. Uh, but I think it's very very serious. I think this is, I look at it as white supremacist's last gasp. Well, I hope it's the last gasp, but is I think it's really serious. Can you draw any kind of parallels to what's going on now, now, to like yeah. reconstruction? Because I think America seems to be as divided now as it was then. Keep in mind, I finished my dissertation right on the eve of the 2000 presidential election. And so voter suppression was, and I remember reading the last documents that I read as I was, as I was actually beginning to write this book was the U.S. Civil Rights Commission report on the election in Florida. The testimony that hundreds of African-Americans, Haitians, Hispanics gave about being denied the right to vote. Because, and, and, and several of them, what they said in their analysis was, and, and I picked up on this, this nation can either become a multi-racial, multilingual democracy, or it could become an apartheid state. That's the path we have before us right now. 
there are people who want us to be able to live in a place where all the people in this room can get together and hang out and do things and learn together. And there are other people that don't want you to vote. Most instrumentally, oh yes. Voter suppression is going to be a struggle that we have for the rest of our lives. And it is rooted in reconstruction. It's rooted in the American Revolution. This society was never set up to be a multiracial democracy. The rights that we have now that we enjoy are things our ancestors fought and died for. Whatever racial background that we were from, whatever gender we're from, whatever language we speak, whether you come from, you have ancestors who work in steel mills in western Pennsylvania or uh, cotton plantations in East Texas, the rights that you enjoy now are rights that, that your or our, our ancestors fought and died for. It makes me so angry sometimes. I remember last year we were asked to talk a lot about women's suffrage, you know, the anniversary of the um, 19th Amendment. Turn on the radio one day, I think it was National Public Radio. Today's the day that the government gave women the right to vote. So angry. How dare they? The government didn't give women the right to vote. Women in this country fought and died and were tortured. Women were waterboarded because they, they, they dared to try to vote. Men thought they were, they were insane. And this shows that any right we have now is something we fought for. And so, yeah, the connections are very, I mean, to me, are crystal clear. And that's what people like Mrs. Dixie taught me and what she and the reason that she wanted us to remember the Tallahassee bus boycott. It wasn't because she wanted to become famous. It was because to her, it was a strategy to keep the movement going. Because for people like Mrs. Dixie or James Walton Johnson or Mrs. Bethune, when the movement dies, we die. That's when hope is lost. And the only chance we have to keep, to keep you know, democracy is to keep the movement going. To prevent us from even teaching or learning about your book in a classroom. I'm giving a lecture about critical race theory Tuesday for Oak Hammock, by the way. Um, but in, in to make it very concise, the reason that they're trying to stop us from teaching critical race theory is they don't want us thinking about racism as a system, as an institution. They don't want us going back and studying the state legislature of Florida in 1907 abrogating the 14th Amendment. They want us to think about racism as an individual choice. Well, it's that, but it's also part of the broader system. That's what they're trying to stop us from understanding. If you don't mind, I have to say this. Teaching critical race theory has nothing to do with what's happening in the legislature and with everybody. It's a power-driven thing. Mm -hmm. If your skin was white, near white, you came from whatever country, your vote was considered a necessary vote is white privilege. So black folk, uh, black I'm talking African born black folk are the ones who are at the bottom of the strata always. And so the powerful ones, the great white fathers I call them, who were always in charge of the vote, always made sure that there were others like them coming along to vote. It didn't matter if they came from another country, but their skin was white. And so I, I know you'd invite me here to this election, no, no, no. But, but I really want people in the room to know that I'm very proud of all of the people you mentioned. I have an acquaintance who study with all of them. I'm very happy to have studied that. I do the work of, you know, I do all of that stuff. But the ba basic of what you're doing is so important and so good and so necessary and so thorough. But if we don't teach the children they will never know that my daddy fought World War II and could not come home and go to elementary school to get a further education unless he sat on the corner after working all day and took, and says black friend picked him up and drove him to Balaka to take night classes. And he's a black soldier. And this is being paid for by the government. But the Lodge County didn't offer him that opportunity. So I think when we talk about this and we read all your work, it's so important. But we have to discern and get to the great divide so that we figure out where we fit in there and how we're going to pull it together. This is the time to pull it together. But you can't fix what you don't acknowledge. So your work is important, and I have to tell you that, but it's important that we all reach a work 
And it's important that we vote for people who will put it in the schools. Thank you. And I just thank you. Even Professor Ortiz can't put it better than that. No. That's the conclusion right there. Thank, thank you, Ms. Filer. Thank you, Ms. Filer. Thank you all for being with us today. Uh, I want to join you, uh, invite you to join Professor Ortiz's book signing. Just outside, we have three of his books for sale in the bookstore of the Harn. You can pick one up. He'll sign it. You can keep chatting about the talk today about emancipation betrayed. You can ask about uh, his other books, uh, People Power and an African and Latinx History. Uh, both all the all three books are available. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your brilliant insights and experiences. And thanks for uh, learning with us from Dr. Ortiz.